Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and in this program we talk about the greatest medical and environmental threats to all life, such as nuclear weapons and nuclear power, global warming, ozone depletion, toxic pollution, deforestation, and many other social and political issues that relate to global well-being. So if you love this planet, keep listening. Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Kristen Iverson, author of the new book Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. She is director of the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Memphis and is also the editor-in-chief of The Pinch, an award-winning literary journal. Kristen Iverson is also the author of Molly Brown, Unraveling the Myth, She's received numerous awards, including the Colorado Book Award for Biography and the Barbara Sudler Award for Nonfiction. Kristen grew up in Arvada, Colorado, near the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weaponry Facility and currently lives in Memphis. Welcome to the program, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I... Uh, your book, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats, is not to be released till June the 5th. So luckily, um, your publisher, wh- who is the publisher? The publisher in the United States is Crown, Crown. and Crown. then it's being published by Random House Harvelsecker in the UK. Yes, and so they sent me uh, a, a, a PDF, and I've almost finished reading it. It's quite long. But I must say that for someone who's seeped in all the evils of the nuclear weaponry and power industry, it's had a very big emotional impact upon me, um, partly because I've be- I was involved to some extent in the Rocky Flat saga, but also to get up close and intimate with it the way you have done in your book is extremely powerful. And... I'm hoping your book sells like crazy in the millions and that everyone reads it and learns what wickedness um, lies behind the whole nuclear industry, both in weapons and in power. So with that introduction, Kristen Iverson, um, how old are you now? I'm 54. Ah. Well, Mm -hmm. now people don't know about your book. So therefore, I'd like you to start at the beginning. Um, the history of your family is interesting, if not a little sad. But mm. tell me um, where you were born, where you grew up. Give people some picture of that wonderful, idyllic life that you led with those gorgeous horses and, mm. and your siblings and the like. Why don't we start there? So we, we've got, we build a bit, paint a bit of a background for people. Okay. Well, I uh, grew up in Arvada, Colorado. Uh, we had two houses there. Our first house was in what's now called Old Town, Arvada. Um, and then when I was around eight years old, my parents built a new house in a subdivision called Bridaldale, which was also in Arvada, but a little further out and closer to the Rocky Flats plant. So how, close, we, um, how close was it in, as the crow flies? A little less than three miles. Oh, dear. Right. And close enough so that we always had lots of animals. We had horses and dogs and cats and just hamsters, birds, everything. And we were outdoors all the time, like all of the kids in my neighborhood. We swam in the lake and rode our horses in the fields and rode our ponies out around the plant. So we were outdoors all the time. Uh, and Rocky Flats was, was ever-present. It, it's been a part of my life since I was a child. We just we never knew what, what uh, went on there. No. So what did your mother think went on there? Well, it was interesting because so many of the um, parents of the kids that I knew as we were growing up worked at Rocky Flats, but Mm -hmm. no one could talk about it. No one could talk about the kind of work that they did. And indeed, many of the workers at the plant didn't know what uh, what other workers in other parts of the plant were doing. 
So there was a lot of secrecy in all sorts of different ways. Uh, when I was a kid, the plant was operated by Dow Chemical, and the rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. Um, we had no idea what was really going on. And there was, a, yeah, what what really got me in the book, uh, Kristen, was, was a degree of, of psychic numbing and denial about Mm-hmm. about the plant. I know that people were sworn to secrecy. Tell us what, what actually was going on at Rocky Flats and how long did it operate? What were they doing? Well, Rocky Flats began operations in 1952, um, years before we moved out there. And uh, Rocky Flats produced plutonium triggers for nuclear bombs. And over the course of almost 40 years, Rocky Flats produced 70,000 plutonium triggers for nuclear bombs. There was extensive radioactive and toxic contamination in the air, in the water, in the soil, and and we didn't know. We never knew. Well, what's a trigger? Well, a trigger is, it, it's actually a little bit of a euphemism. It's really not a correct term because a plutonium trigger is in and of itself a bomb. Um, it's, the, it's the part of the, it, it's an essential component of a nuclear bomb. And the triggers were, uh, or the pits, were created at Rocky Flats, and then they were sent to the Pantex facility in Texas, where the rest of the bomb casing was created. So the heart of every nuclear warhead in the United States, even to the present day, um, almost all of it comes from Rocky Flats. So even though Rocky Flats is no longer producing plutonium triggers, that ended in 1989, um, we're still living with a, with a legacy of the plant itself in so many different ways. Yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. So a trigger is, or they, and I love the euphemism, a button. They call it a button. It's, mm-hmm. is it, it's about 10 pounds of plutonium. Is that right, Kristen? A, a little bit less than that, I think. And it's, it's about the size of a slightly flattened half grapefruit. And uh, workers worked with these buttons. They machined them and shaped them in glove boxes, which were a series of linked... Um, boxes that connected between two different plutonium processing buildings and workers would put their hands into lead lined gloves and peer through a little Benelux or Benelux or plastic window to see how the work was going along and um, that's how the plutonium was shaped and moved along moved along down the line. And what was it was it melted at the plant too uh, and then then put into molds to form the triggers or buttons. Is that right? So they That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. There was a foundry and they were uh, it was melted and shaped there and then machined by the workers by hand. Uh, each particular button or pit was shaped by hand as it moved down the line. The plutonium was made in Hanford and yes. uh, in in special reactors. I think there were seven of them. I've just been to Hanford. It's the most ghastly, diabolical landscape that you could possibly imagine dotted with this old, these old reactors that made the mm-hmm. plutonium for all the bombs that America made. Um, and so they put uranium in the reactors, the uranium fissioned, and as escaping neutrons escape from the fissioning uranium atoms, uranium-238 atoms would capture a neutron and turn into uranium to plutonium-239, which is the material in those buttons or triggers that were made at Rocky Flats. Then they took the, um, the spent fuel rods or the radioactive elements out of those reactors at Hanford. They chopped them apart by remote control because they're so radioactive no one could get near them into little pieces. And then they put those chunks of radioactive material into con- vats of concentrated nitric acid. They're called canyons in the vat. The vats are in the canyons. And they dissolved the pieces of spent fuel rods. And then from that incredibly toxic radioactive solution, they precipitated out the plutonium with various chemical processes, including I think they use kerosene and other things. So they turn, They got the plutonium out of that solution, and I, I'm not sure in what way it was packaged and transported, but it was sent, sent probably by rail or by truck. I'm not sure what, 
to rocky flats. Okay. And those materials, yes, indeed, and those materials, uh, plutonium traveled by rail and by truck and also by airplane. One of the more surprising things that I discovered in my research that I talk about in the book is the fact that, that some of these materials actually traveled by plane in and out of uh, Stapleton Airport in Denver on commercial and non-commercial flights. Unbelievable. With so, very, what? Yeah, with very little security and people didn't know about that. Oh. Well, why don't you talk about the toxicity of plutonium, Kristen, and also critical mass. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, plutonium, of course, is incredibly uh, toxic. One millionth of a gram of plutonium, particularly if it is inhaled into the lungs, uh, can cause cancer or cause a health effect. And um, I saw the results of this not only in my own personal experience and the experience of the people that I grew up with and the people that I worked with, But, of course, uh, in all the health studies that have been done out at Rocky Flats, um, particularly the studies uh, done by Carl Johnson in the 1970s, and he was director of the uh, Colorado Health Department, and he was the first person to really kind of blow the whistle and say, um, this is an extremely toxic uh, problem here, and it's affecting the local population. It's having health effects in the local population. He was the first person to really draw attention to the matter. Yes, I want to get back to Carl Johnson in a minute. But when plutonium was discovered by Glenn Seaborg, um, they decided that a millionth of a gram is carcinogenic. That's a very minute amount. But I did read, Kristen, and I want to know if you've read the study, that when they injected plutonium into beagle dogs, they didn't find a dose low enough that didn't give all the dogs cancer. Do you know of that study? Because I can't find it anywhere. Oh, fascinating. I'm not familiar with that, with the Beagle study. But I know that in the United States, uh, there were a number of studies that were done on human subjects with plutonium. And those studies are covered in a wonderful book called The Plutonium Files by Eileen Wilson. Uh, It's really a great book, very, very thorough. Um, So there have been a number of, of studies on how plutonium affects the human body and how deadly it can be whether it's taken in through the lungs or somehow enters the body through an open cut or a wound or something like that. Um, Yeah. Didn't they, they used to inject it into prison inmates and mentally retarded people, didn't they, to see what would happen? That's correct. Mm -hmm, That's correct, without their knowledge or awareness. Or or permission. Or permission. So, okay, now... um, Talk about critical mass, because I can't understand if you've got 10 pounds of plutonium, which is critical mass, and will explode with a nuclear explosion spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Are these buttons or triggers the size of a squashed half grapefruit? Are they less than 10 pounds so that they don't explode? And, And then how do they make them explode if it's not actually critical mass when they blow up the bomb? Well, each particular plutonium trigger um, holds enough breathable particles particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth, and I think that's that's um, uh, one way to look at it. Um, Ten pounds of plutonium is critical mass, and -hmm. there was an experimenter in the Manhattan Project years and years ago when they were making the bombs, and he had, I think, two... um, half uh, two semicircles of plutonium each about five pounds and they were separated at hemispheres by a screwdriver and the screwdriver slipped and the hemispheres came together and there was a blinding blue flash and he virtually disappeared and so did the other people working in the room with him in other words the plutonium reached critical mass and exploded so 10 pounds is critical mass. So they take these, I hate the word triggers or buttons, what a euphemism, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the bomb factory at Pantex and they surround that plutonium trigger with with conventional explosives and it's a very tightly uh, formed geomet- geometrical process and when the ex- conventional explosives explode they press down and implode on that plutonium trigger 
and the plutonium reaches critical mass and then there is a nuclear explosion. And that's an atomic bomb. But for a hydrogen bomb, which is by orders of magnitude bigger, you have the first, the primary mechanism, which is the one I just described where the plutonium explodes. And so much gamma radiation is given off that it's reflected off the very shiny stainless steel capsule of the hydrogen bomb and focused on the secondary mechanism, which is made of deuterium and tritium. And so the gamma radiation is so intense that deuterium and tritium produce a fusion explosion, which is what the energy released inside the center of the sun. So you get fission in the, in the nuclear, in the plutonium part, you get fusion in the deuterium and tritium, the secondary part, and then the whole capsule of the bomb is made of uranium-238, I think. And so the, then you get another fission explosion triggered by the fusion mechanism. So you get fission in the primary, fusion in the secondary, and fission in the third part. Fission, fusion, fission. And hydrogen bombs can be made as big as you like. You could make a 50 megaton bomb equivalent to 15 million tons of TNT. And the bomb used on Hiroshima was 15,000 tons of TNT. Um, and I'm interested to hear you say, Kristen, that 70,000 triggers were made at Rocky Flats during the Cold War. But in fact, it was probably 77,000 because I've read that America, in fact, did make 77,000 nuclear weapons um, mm -hmm. during that time when 1,000 nuclear weapons dropping on 100 cities would create such um, dust and smoke in the stratosphere. It would block out the sun for 10 years, causing a short ice age and the end of all life on Earth. So 1,000 bombs can end life on Earth. And America, during its time of nuclear addiction made 77,000 of the things. I don't mm -hmm. know. And Russia didn't make as many, but it made quite a lot. Anyway, so that was just a little background in the production of nuclear weapons. So um, I was, I think we should now next talk about the two major fires, Kristen, the one in 1957, which very int it interests me a lot and the one on Mother's Day in 1969 and you described that so beautifully so let's go back to the fire in 1957 at Rocky Flats tell us what mm -hmm. happened and how it occurred please well what happened in 1957 is that there was a fire in the plutonium processing building and uh, sparks caught on fire and uh, were undetected and that fire burned for many hours, I think almost 12 hours altogether, um, before it was brought under control. And there was no evacuation. Um, there was no mention in the newspapers or anything that this fire had happened. And it was so extreme that it burned out all of the filters and all of the monitoring equipment. So to the present day, to this very day, they still don't know exactly how much plutonium and other types of materials escaped into the environment. The only thing that appeared in the local newspapers at the time was a very small mention that said that there had been a minor accident at Rocky Flats and everything was fine and we shouldn't, uh, there was nothing to worry about. Well, so the public you, was completely... Yeah, the public was in the dark. Where, when you say the filters, so the filters which filter out the plutonium so it doesn't go into the air um, were burnt out. So so was was the whole sealing the roof of the building burnt so that all the plutonium that was being burnt in that 1957 fire escaped virtually into the atmosphere, Kristen? The roof of the building did not burn or melt. Uh, in the 1969 fire, we came very close to having the entire roof lost, uh, which would have been devastating mm. for the entire uh, Denver metro area and Colorado as a whole. But in the 1957 fire, it was primarily the, the filters, and it, was, uh, it didn't melt the, melt the roof like, like the 1969 fire did. Well, when the filters burnt, though, does that mean the stuff in the filters, which was plutonium primarily, did that mm -hmm. escape into mm -hmm. the atmosphere? 
Yes, it did. Okay. Now, so tell yes, it did. people... Plutonium... Go on. Oh, I was just going to say plutonium was later detected as far as... There was a radioactive cloud that traveled throughout the Denver area, and plutonium was detected um, by the Department of Energy and other independent studies uh, as far away as 30 miles from the plant site itself. How far is Denver from Rocky Flats? It's about 13 miles. 13. And what was the population? And then Boulder. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Boulder, uh, Boulder is just up the road. Boulder's just and up Boulder the road. Up. Yes. I know Boulder, right. Boulder is upwind, not downwind, except the winds do change, don't they? So sometimes Boulder is in the line of fire from the winds coming from Rocky Flats? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not directly downwind. Our house, my childhood home, was directly downwind. Uh but Boulder is a little bit uh, upwind, and so you don't see the same uh, cancer uh, statistics that you do in the downwind areas. But Denver's 13 miles from Rocky Flats, and Denver is downwind, right? Right, that's correct. And what was the population of Denver at the time of the 1957 plutonium fire? Um, I have that information. and I'm Well, just right ballpark. Now. You know, was it a million or was it half a million or what? Uh, it was more than that. Den- at the time, Denver, the Denver metropolitan area and all the suburbs around it, Arvada, uh, Golden, Westminster, North Glen, all of those suburbs, it was one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Mm. Yeah, I know that. Now, the reason that there was a fire in 57 was that plutonium is naturally pyrophoric in other words it burns spontaneously so when there's a spark created by the the machining of plutonium it's easy enough for the surrounding plutonium that's being worked on to catch fire is that not right Kristen? That's absolutely true it's highly flammable and uh, you can't use water to extinguish it, and that was a problem in both the 1957 and the 1969 fires. Um, they struggled to contain it, and when um, more traditional or conventional ways didn't work, they ultimately ended up having to use water, which, of course, is very risky, because when you use water on plutonium, you run the risk of creating a criticality or a nuclear chain reaction. Now, okay, so in your book... <laughs> you described that they used water in the 1957 fire and there was a blinding blue flash. Mm-hmm. Well, tell us what that's about. Well, there is um, conflicting evidence on that, um, depending upon what source you look at, but I think many experts at this point do believe that there was a criticality during that 1957 fire. And certainly... Um, Many of the people that I interviewed who were workers or scientists or engineers felt that that uh, could, certainly could have been the case and that there was some evidence in the environment to support that. It was a very extreme fire. Okay, so tell us what the evidence was, Kristen, in the environment. There is, there is uh, evidence of uh, cesium in the environment and uh, other elements that that would support the fact that that a criticality may have occurred. Those elements are only formed when plutonium fissions and they're finding cesium and other such elements in the environment, in the grasses and the soil and the like. And so it seemed to me from reading your book, Kristen, and you were a little subtle about this, but um, that the officialdom, officialdom lied and that there was a criticality. All the evidence points to that, and certainly that's what happened. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say, wouldn't you? Well, I would say that there certainly is a significant amount of evidence that, that points to that. The Department of Energy and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has always been adamant that a criticality did not occur. They're lying. Uh, but They're the, lying. Evidence, the evidence seems, <laughs> seems to point otherwise. It makes me so cross when these people lie, and I think that's what I got out of your book too, that the duplicity was absolutely profound. I want everyone to read this book, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. It's one of the scariest books, I think, that I have ever read, and I've read a lot of scary books. Now... Kristen Iverson, I want you to talk about 
the Mother's Day fire on in 1969. I want you to describe what your family was doing that day and all your friends and neighbours around and what happened. Get, describe it the way you did in the book. Well, on that particular Sunday morning, Mother's Day in 1969, um, my family, uh, we were out for Sunday brunch for Mother's Day. I have two sisters and a brother. Uh, I'm the oldest, and uh, my father was an attorney, my mother a housewife, and Mother's Day was a big deal for us. You know, so we went out to a local restaurant, to an Italian restaurant for brunch, and like many families yeah, in our neighborhood, and uh, we had no idea what was going on at Rocky Flats. Uh, even the workers, uh, the way I tell the story in the book, uh, two workers in particular, Stan Skinger and Bill Dennison, who were guards and not firefighters, by the way, um, they came into work, and it was a short staff day because it was Mother's Day. And they showed up at the gate, and the guard at the gate said, um, Rather than go to your regular post, we need you to go down to building 776, 777. There's a fire. And the men knew, of course, at that point that a fire in the plutonium processing building was a very serious thing. Mm. So they went down to, uh, they drove immediately down to the building and suited up and uh, were called in to, to fight this fire. They weren't trained to fight it. They weren't prepared for that. Um the plant was in a panic. They were trying to get other firefighters to come in from other districts. Of course, it was a holiday. Um, they had a hard time getting men. They had a hard time getting equipment. And these two these two guards, Bill Dennison and, and Stan Skinger, really uh, were heroes because they went in there not knowing what they were getting going to get into, not knowing how it was going to go. And they were crucial to the to the ultimate um, success of, of, of ending that fire. But the fire went on for a very long time, and uh, we didn't know, of course, and we were outside, and uh, the fire was so extreme that, that the roof of the building nearly melted. It rose like a bubble, mm. almost like a marshmallow, a melted marshmallow. Uh, and if that roof had uh, actually been breached in any way and there had been uh, an accident of catastrophic proportion, I would not be here talking to you today because we were just a, a couple miles away um, having our Mother's Day brunch. As were a lot of other families. Now, so, um, how, was there, were there any measurements of plutonium in Denver after that fire, Kristen? There was, uh, yes, and it, again, um, measurements proved that plutonium was carried uh, miles beyond the plant uh, parameters. But again, people were not warned, um, and uh, there was no follow-up in terms of any sort of potential health effect on the local population. And what was the article in the Denver Post reporting that fire? Well, I think this is um, a very interesting thing to note, and it's a, rather amusing in a way. The article in the newspaper that mentioned that there was a very small fire, uh, a small accident at Rocky Flats, Again, it was minimalized, and it was toward the back of the paper, and it was right next to a picture of a dog, a beagle, a pet of the week, you know, <laughs> adopt this pet from the local uh, humane society. So it was very much minimized, and, and people didn't know. Do you think that the editors at the Denver Post didn't know or were involved in the cover-up? I think that... Um, there had been a veil of secrecy around Rocky Flats for so long that it was quite accepted in the press and in the population. And I think that that veil of secrecy continues to the present day to a certain extent. And uh, the fact that it was the Cold War and um, people didn't ask questions, we, I think all of us living in the Denver area, uh, we just tended to um, accept what we were told, and we didn't ask questions. And certainly in my neighborhood and in my family, uh, we didn't ask questions. So what little bit that we were told, and much of what we were told, I think, was, was not true um, because it was the Cold War and everything was operating behind this veil of secrecy. People didn't ask questions like they should have. It wasn't really until the activists came along in the 1970s and we began to learn what was really going on at the plant that people started to question 
And as we're talking, remember everyone who's listening that a millionth of a gram of plutonium if inhaled will probably give you cancer. What happened to those two very brave men um, that fought the fire, Kristen, in the 1969 accident? What, what, tell us how they tried to um, clean up their bodies and get the radiation off and, and what that did to them. And tell us what happened to their health in the long run. Well, both of them, of course, immediately following the fire, went through the kind of standard decontamination procedure that firefighters um, or workers who are exposed go through at that point. And ultimately in that fire, 44 workers were exposed. Um, some of them suffered uh, rather extensive health effects and others less so. Bill Dennison and Stan Skinger were both contaminated. Um, plutonium entered into their bodies, and it was... Um, tested in a number of ways. They do a nasal swipe and other kinds of tests to determine how much plutonium has been absorbed into the body. Um, Bill Dennison um, became sterile after that point. He and his wife could have um, no children, although I think one of the more wonderful aspects of his story is that they adopted many children after that point uh, and had a large family anyway. But he, uh, he became ill eventually, and then Stan Skinger also became ill with mesothelioma, uh, a lung disease which was attributed to um, the exposure that he received during the fire. He had rather um, a very dramatic moment when his mask was ripped off when they were inside the plutonium facility, inside the plutonium building, and his mask was ripped from his face, and he had several minutes of having to breathe in all of the stuff that was in the air there. So he had a rather extreme exposure in his lungs. So and did they... Stan, oh. Finish what oh, I was just going to say, uh, I just wanted to tell you what happened with Stan Skinter yeah. because it's, it's kind of an amazing story. He did not uh, continue working for Rocky Flats too much longer after that. He felt that he had been exposed, and the company was saying that they didn't think that his, his exposure uh, was that extreme or would lead to any health effects. So he ultimately decided to leave the company and pursue um, another career path. And one of the things that he did uh, eventually was that he was a volunteer at the Denver Botanical Gardens. And when Stan Skinger passed away um, due to uh, injuries that he received in this fire, they named a lily after him. So there's a Skinger lily uh, at the Denver Botanical Museum, and it's a beautiful flower. Did he die of cancer? He died of mesothelioma. And what about the other one? I believe Bill Denison died of cancer. Well, Mises they both lived for they both they both lived for a number of years after the fire, mm. and Bill Dennison continued to work at Rocky Flats, although well, um, they after a certain once a worker uh, it reaches a certain point of contamination, they have to be moved out of those areas, and they can no longer work in in areas that are considered hot or radioactive where they might be exposed, and sometimes that had very ill effects um, on a worker's career. For example. Charlie Parisi, who was a firefighter who actually carried Bill Dennison out at the end. Um, he uh, was a firefighter. He was exposed um, to plutonium in the fire, and as a result of his exposure, uh, he was taken out of that position and went back to work as a janitor and had to take a pay cut as a result. Yes, that absolutely shocked me. How dare they produce a pay cut to a man who's been so brave and exposed to so much plutonium and then degrade him into a janitor and, and pay him less. I mean, how dare they? I, that, that just took mm -hmm. my breath away, Kristen. Well, and it's also interesting to note, Helen, how many people went to work at Rocky Flats and started out as janitors or in the cafeteria or as a secretary. Um, Rocky Flats was indeed... Uh, at the time, one of the best jobs in town. I, I went to work at Rocky Flats when I was a graduate student. I was in college, putting myself through school, and I had two. Uh, I was a single parent with two young children, and uh, Rocky Flats was considered the best job in town in a lot of different ways. And uh, I think what happened to a lot of the kids that I went to high school with. Um, they started out in the cafeteria. They started out as janitors. I was working as a secretary, administrative assistant. And then once you work out there for a little while, um, and then you can eventually apply to get clearance and work in some of the other areas. 
as a radiation monitor or eventually work on the plutonium line itself, which, of course, paid at a much higher rate. But I think a lot of people who went to work at Rocky Flats, at first you don't really know what you're getting into and, and you don't really know what's going on at the plant. Well, you didn't, did you? I mean, for many years, it's so interesting how you interspersed your book with what is the hard data that's going on at the plant and the dreadful things that are happening, interspersed with how you are living your life in total ignorance, riding your beautiful horses and feeling the sun on your face and looking at the dark mountains and swimming in that incredibly contaminated lake, contaminated with tritium and plutonium and and the like and being with all all your friends and... And, and how just very, very, very gradually the truth started to dawn upon you, even when you went to work at Rocky Flats, you were virtually unaware of what was going on. Yes, indeed. I, I think the book is really about my own awakening in so many different ways. And when I was a kid uh, in Bridaldale in my neighborhood, um, we weren't allowed to talk about Rocky Flats. No one talked about Rocky Flats. And we were supposed to believe what the government told us. Uh, when the protests started going on out at Rocky Flats, everyone in my neighborhood, and, and even my father, who also has had a, a bit of a change of heart here, uh, um, you know, we thought, oh, you know, he would say, oh, those, those people out there at the protesting, they're just hippies and housewives and students who don't have jobs and that sort of thing. And we, and we didn't take it very seriously. And there was so much invested in... In, in keeping quiet, and I, I think, honestly, people were also concerned, as they are to the present day, about property values um, and all that sort of thing. And, and I think people don't want to think that think about the fact that they might be living in an area that's really profoundly contaminated. My parents wanted to believe that they were raising their four children in the perfect environment. You know, we had a, we had a wonderful house. Um, we could be outdoors all the time, and we were outdoors all the time, swimming in the lake and, and playing and, and running in the fields. And we spent all of our time out of doors, like, like all the other kids in the neighborhood. And it took a long time um, for me to realize, for any of us to realize exactly what was going on. And even when I worked out at Rocky Flats, when I first started working there, I was told specifically, this is the safest place you will ever work. Mm. And I thought, okay, and they had changed the name. It was no longer, it was called the Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site. And I had been, um, I missed the raid in 1989 and some of the other things that happened around there because I had uh, moved to Europe for a couple of years and I was working as a travel writer. And I think one of the most ironic aspects of, of my personal life is that I've always wanted to be a writer, I've always been a writer, And I spent a great many years, or you know, three years, trotting around Europe looking for good things to write about. And the most ironic thing is that the biggest story for me turned out to be quite literally in my own backyard, in the soil of my own backyard. And I just, I, I, I couldn't see it when I was living there. I didn't see it. I couldn't understand it. When I came back from Germany. And uh, this was in 1988, 1989, 1990. Um, I had wanted to be in Germany when the wall came down. Uh, I had to come back to the States just before that happened. And I watched the wall come down on, on television. I was watching it on television. And at that point, a little light went off in my head. And I thought, oh, my God, this thing that I'm now watching on television is connected to what's been happening in my backyard. That, to what's been happening in my neighborhood, that Rocky Flats is such a, a, a profound part of the Cold War and everything that happened. But it took me a long time to see that. And when I was working at the plant, I'll never forget the day that I came home uh, and I had two young sons, Sean and Nathan, and I uh, came home and picked them up from daycare and came home from work and fed them their suppers and gave them their baths and put them to bed and then I went downstairs to fix myself a cup of tea and turned on the television, and there was a Nightline episode on Rocky Flats. And all of a sudden, I saw the narrator interviewing people that I worked with every day, like Mark Silverman, um, who was the uh, DOE manager at Rocky Flats at the time. 
and he was he was quite up front. He was one of the few managers out at Rocky Flats who was quite up front, and he described what was going on, that there were 13.2 tons or more of plutonium stored in various stages around the plant, um, that there was no safe storage, there was no place to send the plutonium. Um, there were leaks and problems all over the place, and it was a shocking moment to me. I sat there stunned. I'll never forget <laughs> in my nightgown in the dark, thinking, I can't believe this. How could I not have known all of this? How could we not have known all of this and known that all of this was going on? So I knew when I went into work the next morning that I was going to leave. And the day that I did leave, I knew that I would someday write a book about it. Yes, it just makes my blood run cold. I've got lots and lots of questions. So, Kristen, um, how many of your friends have developed cancer and, and their parents who lived in the neighbourhood where you lived, the highly contaminated area, three miles downwind from Rocky Flats? Almost every family that we knew in our neighbourhood has been affected by cancer in some way or another. Now, of course, um, some people will say that there's no way to prove a direct link between cancer or health effect and what happened at Rocky Flats. And certainly that has been the position of the Department of Energy and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for years. Um, so I guess in a way, partly what I'm saying here is circumstantial evidence, but nearly every single family that we grew up with has, had, has been affected by cancer. Uh, my family uh, has been affected. I have been affected. How? I have a scarlet Tell us lymphoma. What happened? To, mm. I want to hear about your family specifically and you. What What are the diagnoses? Well, I think, first of all, let me say that with respect to my family, um, I think we've been very lucky compared to many of our neighbors. Mm. Um, all of us have had uh, odd symptoms of an ongoing kind of um, hard to diagnose health problems um, such as chronic fatigue, exhaustion, a high white blood cell count. Um, my brother has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, one of my sisters has had several bouts of, of cancer related to her reproductive system. I had a scare with lymphoma. They you, thought it was lymphoma. It was um, lymphoma or not? It was not, ultimately. I was diagnosed with lymphoma. And uh, they and I had surgery, and they took out my left lymph node, and then they determined that it was not lymphoma. Mm. And I'll never forget the doctor said, "I don't know. We don't know what your body is fighting. Your body is fighting. It's not cancer at this point. Um, it might turn into cancer. We don't know. Hopefully not. Um, but we can't tell you exactly what your body is fighting. Mm. It's fighting something. And that has been the consistent diagnosis for for me as well as my siblings." over time um, but we're all still here and I think we've been lucky uh, one of the people that I write about in the book is this incredible woman named Tamara Mesa her family lived just down the road from ours and uh, they're uh, it's a Mormon family they had several kids a little bit younger than we were so we really didn't play with those kids, but we knew them well, and we knew the family because our pony, we had a Shetland pony named Barney, and he uh, was always getting out, and he liked to go over to their garden and sneak things out of their garden. And so I would have to get up and go rescue him, and um, Tamara's father would get very angry at me or angry at Barney. And it was this kind of ongoing thing. They were very nice, but they didn't like our horses getting into their garden. And they were, uh, they are a Mormon family. They raise their own vegetables. They raise, they raise cattle, they had horses, um, all sorts of things, very similar to what we had, with the difference that they lived more directly off the land. They ate the vegetables out of their garden, they had a well, and they drank the water directly out of that well, and the well tapped into the Stanley Lake water table. My father tried to dig a well several times, and we could never get water, and we're still not sure why. Um, but thank goodness, because we, we didn't drink that water. We went on city water, and we never drank the water up out of that water table. Which was uh, contaminated. But what happened to, yes, indeed, it was contaminated with plutonium. And the sediment in the lake, in Stanley Lake, is still contaminated. It's still there. Um, and with yet they plutonium. Allow, with plutonium. Exactly, with plutonium. 
to the present day, and they allow public. Um, it's, it's an open recreation area. Really? They allow both. Really? <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I just want to say a word more about Tamara Mesa. Um, she really is an incredible person, and she's had over the years. Uh, I think she's now in her late thirties. She's had many, many surgeries for brain tumors, seven, eight, nine surgeries. And with her first diagnosis, they gave her only a uh, matter of months to live, and she has just fought and fought and fought. And uh, she's still alive and, and very articulate, and, um, and her, she and her family um, are pretty sure that everything that she has gone through and everything that the rest of the family has gone through is somehow related to Rocky Flats. Their house was directly downwind from the plant across the lake. So whatever came down off the mountains with the Chinook winds, the wind swept down from the mountains and came across the plant site and then directly into the neighborhoods downwind from Rocky Flats. And, so our house and, that area. and your book talks about the fact that they were pretty t- continuously incinerating waste with plutonium in it and shooting, shooting the stuff out the chimneys, right? Exactly. For decades, um, they burned plutonium-contaminated waste in an incinerator, and that was um, that was put out into the environment. And then plutonium also escaped in a number of different ways on the plant through rooftops and vents and that sort of thing. Um, so the filters were um, not very successful in keeping the air clean, and um, there is evidence. Uh, and I mention this in my book, and there certainly is a great deal written about this aspect of it in the newspapers, some of the workers um, got so frustrated with uh, how the filtering system would get clogged, clogged up that they would actually punch holes in the filters to kind of keep things moving. Yes, and then they had thousands or millions of gallons of contaminated water with plutonium and all sorts of toxic chemicals, which they turned into, what is it called, a concrete or something which didn't work and they put that concrete radioactive waste and mixed waste into cardboard boxes the size of refrigerators and they had I don't ha, tell us how many of these cardboard boxes of what what's the stuff called it which was leaking and didn't work as set as concrete and it went to the water supply and down into your lake and your rivers and the like well, the, it's called Pond Crete. Pond Crete. And uh, Pond Crete. The workers had different names for it. Um, it was called Jelly or the Jelly Factory, Plutonium Pudding. Um, there are a number of names for it. But basically what happened was that um, liquid waste contaminated with plutonium was stored in open solar ponds with the hope that with the uh, they hoped that it would eventually evaporate enough that they could somehow repackage this waste and then um, ship it somewhere off site um, but that didn't work very well and then they had an idea of mixing this liquid with concrete and that would somehow solidify and contain the plutonium and they called that pondcrete they took the pondcrete and put it into um, square boxes the size of small refrigerators and uh, then those were wrapped in plastic and allowed to stand outdoors in the open Uh, and the problem is that the concrete never completely solidified it turned into a kind of a a jelly kind of a jello workers would come along and they could stick their thumbs in it to to test how solid it was and it it never solidified so eventually we had um, almost 12,000 pondcrete blocks standing out in the open and more than 8,000 of those blocks leaked into the ground and into the environment. Have they moved them? What's happened to them? Well, the Rocky Flat site now has been uh, closed. Plutonium pit production ended in 1989 or shortly after the uh, FBI raid in 1989. And then there was a long period of um, so-called cleanup, uh, and I say so-called because the, the site as it stands now, it's been a very controversial cleanup, and, and there's still a great deal of material that remains on site. Uh, but it is closed, and uh, 
approximately one-fourth of the site remaining, more than 1,000 acres, is permanently closed off and sealed and can never be open for human habitation. The rest of the site is slated to open as a public wildlife refuge and uh, recreation area for hiking and biking and possibly even hunting. It hasn't opened yet, um, and it's it's my hope personally that it that it never opens. I don't think it should ever open, um, but but that's that's the way it stands now. So if you go out to Rocky Flats now, and I was just out there recently, and look at the site, um, you won't see anything but open fields. Uh, it looks clean, it looks pristine, but it is not clean. It is not pristine, and there are no signs or anything out there to tell people. What happened? It's highly contaminated. In the past. Highly contaminated, yeah. like Hanford. Highly contaminated, and the rabbits are contaminated, and the wildlife is contaminated with plutonium and other isotopes. It's just, <laughs> and what what happened to the buildings? You know, seven 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 with the glove boxes and everything. Though incredibly contaminated buildings, Kristen. Mm-hmm. What did they well, take I, them I, apart I or what? Well, um, much of the site was dismantled, uh, and a lot of that material was shipped off to different um, facilities um, around the country, including the Savannah River site in Georgia. Uh, And yet a lot of material remains. Uh. And given the um, compromised um, cleanup, I mean, at one point the Department of Energy said in 1995, when I was working at the plant, they said that it would take 70 years and $36 billion to clean up Rocky Flats, and then they didn't believe that they had the technology to adequately do it. No. That was modified over the years, and a number of compromises were made, and uh, Kaiser Hill LLC took over the cleanup and uh, completed it in less than 10 years at a cost of less than $7 billion. And what we're left with is, is a compromised site with cleanup standards that are not adequate, and anything below six feet um, is, for the most part, still there, even though much of the material between the buildings um, was moved between buildings through underground tunnels and that sort of thing, and many, many things were buried at the site. Uh, and yet the, the deal that was made was that anything below six feet would not be cleaned up unless it posed a direct threat to local water supplies. Um, and yet uh, ongoing studies indicate that um, that there is still material escaping out into the local areas. Of course, and what really amazes me, Kristen, is, is the real estate stuff, houses built right up to the border of Rocky Flats, I mean, and still. And so the, the officials underplay, underestimate, understate the contamination that still is ongoing in the lake, the rivers, the soil, um, you know, in the food and everything to keep the real estate values high. And mm-hmm. and and then last but not least is Dr. Carl Johnson. I knew Carl. What a wonderful, lovely man. And they really were so nasty and cruel to Carl. But he produced figures on cancer data in surrounding populations and in Denver, didn't he? We've only got a few minutes left. Can you briefly summarize what what Carl, uh, the data that Carl produced, Kristen, please? Well, Dr. Johnson found elevated rates of cancer, a number of different types of cancer in men and women um, in the areas in the neighborhoods around Rocky Flats. And I want to emphasize that later data by the Department of Energy itself confirmed his, his information, confirmed his studies. Mm. Um, but what happened with Carl Johnson briefly is that, of course, he, he lost his job. They uh, fired and, him. Yeah, they fired him. And there was the only reason to fire him. Uh, the, board, the board at that time, they said, well, we have the right to fire a person for the, for the color of his tie, if, if necessary. <laughs> So he was fired without reason and, and forced to leave the state. He later won a whistleblower lawsuit. He was right, and he won. But people in Colorado don't know that. And uh, I think the way the historical record kind of looks at Dr. Carl Johnson, who really is a hero and should be recognized as such, but most people in Colorado don't know about him, and what little they know, they think that he was fired and run out of, state, and run out of the state because his data was incorrect, and that's not true. So there's a high incidence of cancer. He found of testicular cancer, lung cancer, 
I think thyroid cancer, all sorts of cancers, brain cancers, and it's ongoing. And because mm -hmm. plutonium, its half-life is 24,400 years, so it lasts for at least a quarter of a million years. Those areas that have been highly contaminated and will continue to be so, will be so for half a million years. There's an excellent map that was produced by the Department of Energy, in fact, that shows the areas of contamination around Rocky Flats, and I think people need to know of that map and be aware of it and pay attention to it. Yes, and, and you have to know that those two fires and also the continuous release of plutonium from that factory for decades has contaminated Denver. It is true, and there was yes. a, an alert that if there was a major fire, in fact, Denver would have to be evacuated. So Denver's mm -hmm. a, a contentious situation and when I go out there there's hardly any publicity there's hardly any knowledge uh, uh, of by the people of this very serious health situation and I don't even think that there have been decent epidemiological studies done of the population in Ven Denver who lived there when that contamination was occurring and what their cancer incidence has been. Um, is that true Kristen? That is that there was a ten year study, um, the public historical public exposure study, but that relied on dose reconstruction yeah. where they tried to kind of guess how much plutonium was released and then determine how yeah. many people might be affected. There has never been a health study no. of people who live near Rocky Flats or who grew up near Rocky Flats. No. This is an area with a lot of erosion, a lot of rain and snow and, and wind. The wind out in this area is just incredible, very, very strong winds. And then you have the wildlife. There's plutonium uptake in the grass. The deer come along and eat the grass and go off site. And then there are gophers and all, squirrels and all sorts of little animals that are busy moving all this soil around out there. And the plutonium hasn't gone anywhere. There's been no cleanup off site at all. And so all of these all these plutonium particles are still being very actively being moved around. Yeah. Well, on that rather depressing note, we're going to have to end, Kristen Iverson. It's been absolutely fascinating. I could talk to you for hours, but um, because I can't and because we can't listen to you for hours, I just strongly suggest um, that everyone reads Kristen's new book, which is being published by Crown um, on June the 5th, called Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm very privileged indeed that you should uh, talk to me today. And indeed, this is your first interview on your new book, and I wish you the very best of luck. But this book is more than important, more than important. Thank you for writing it. Thank you so much, Helen. It's been a pleasure. On If You Love This Planet Today, I've been speaking with Kristen Iverson, author of the new book, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Shadow of Rocky Flats, to be published by Crown Publishing on June the 5th. And I would strongly advise that all of you buy it or download it on your Kindles. Thanks for listening today. Uh, we'll be back with another fascinating interview, no doubt, next week. Bye for now.